it's my privilege to uh, give Father Robin a, a, a return trip to his, his pulpit of many years uh, this morning. So Father Robin, would you come up here? Um, many of you know uh, Father Robin was the rector at Epiphany for 17 years, um, and it's just wonderful to have him back with us, and, and not only in the congregation today, um, but preaching as well. So I'm going to pray for Father Robin, and we'll let him do that. Lord God, we ask your blessing on Robin. We ask, Lord, that we would hear your word and his words. Uh, we pray, Lord, um, that you would plant its seed deep in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If I just took this with me, we could see how good he is. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be a real short sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter, uh, for the privilege of uh, coming here to share the word. And uh, it's fun being together again. Really good. Thank you so much. The parable of the sower is uh, obviously one of those parables that Jesus uses to, uh, to get across a spiritual truth, but to do it in a form that makes people have to engage. It's part of a series of parables. In Matthew 13, uh, we see Jesus' miracles, uh, we see his healings, and it's bookended by Matthew 12, where we see the religious authorities' opposition to those things. Uh, basically, it's law versus healing over and over again. Then there's this parable of the sower, and then after this are the parables about the kingdom of God and what it's like. And the disciples asked Jesus to interpret for them the meaning of the parable. And he basically explains why he talks to them of parables, and he quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And he, he gives the reason as this. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. They have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Wait a minute, that's not fair. I, this is not Isaiah, now this is just me. So, <laughs> so people read this, and of course you read the parable, the, the uh, seed that fell on the hard ground, uh, the person didn't understand it, and then the devil comes and snatches the word away. And we hear that and think, God is not fair. I mean, he should work with these guys so that they, they can understand. Understanding here is, is more of a picture of putting two and two together. The Pharisees, the religious authorities, they were watching Jesus fulfill Old Testament prophecy, which they knew by heart. He would even do it in the same places that prophets before him healed people and rose from the dead. They couldn't put two and two together because what was blinding them was their own self-interest. So that's what's going on here. He could have explained everything, but it wouldn't have changed the heart. But isn't it odd how we want God to take responsibility for all the bad things that happen? I mean, you hear this all the time, right? If God was really a loving God, why would he let this murder happen? Why would he let these mass calamities happen? Um, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and we expect him to take care of all of that, even our own willful rejection of him. But he doesn't do that because he's created us to love him of our own free will, not to hypnotize us into just serving him like puppets. So the willful rejection of Jesus is one of the themes that runs through these parables. This is the blindness and the hardness of heart that characterizes rebellion against God. It's just a rebellion. Jesus had to endure the opposition from the temple elite who were so blind and so deaf, they couldn't see the love of God. All they could see was that the rules were broken. A, a good example of this is the account of the man with the wither, withered hand. Do you remember that? Um, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus encounters this man who's got a, a physical deformity. And since it was the Sabbath, the temple elite are gathering around and they're waiting to pull the trigger. They're waiting to see if Jesus is going to violate the rules of the Sabbath by healing this man. And Jesus brings him out in front of them and he asks them this question. 
Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is it a day to save life or to destroy it? And he heals the man, and they go out and start putting plans together for Jesus' arrest and execution. That's the blindness. That's the not understanding. Nothing hardens the heart like pride. What was really unfair was that they were willing to let this man live the rest of his life with a deformity and everything that that entailed in that culture rather than have him be healed by a guy who was threatening their power. Somebody once said, uh, the center of sin is the letter I. It's me. It sets up the parable in the gospel about the sower, the hard soil, the thorny soil, the shallow soil. It's an, a picture of the inner disposition of our hearts. And not only are people deaf to Jesus' words, they're blind to the demonstrated power of God. For the Pharisees, so much so that they were willing to attribute the miracles and the healing power of Jesus to Satan and saying he's doing this by the power of Satan. Uh, you Just parenthetically, you may have heard the unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the spirit. That's what it is. It's saying Jesus does things by the power of Satan. So I think it's safe to say everybody's off the hook on that one. Some people are like, oh my gosh, did I do that? Maybe I didn't know I did that and it's unforgivable. No, you would have to go all the way over for that to happen. So Jesus addresses the Pharisees. He's also addressing the crowds. The crowds aren't the same as disciples. They would have disciples mixed in with them, but basically these are masses of people who are roaming around following Jesus because they want to be healed or they want more bread like Jesus did in the miracle of the loaves and fishes. So there's lots of people gathered around him, but they're not necessarily devoted to him as Messiah. Some get really excited really fast and just as unexcited really fast, and that's the shallow soil. Some of them are already occupied with some other Messiah, like the rich young ruler. He wants to follow Jesus, but when, uh, when confronted with the fact that he needs to give up his stuff, he can't do it. So you can see how these soils are uh, giving us a picture of what's inside people. But I want to suggest that the real star of this parable is, in fact, the sower. Believe it or not, the Bible is more about God than it is about you and me. Um, God's the one who sows the seeds. God is the one who takes the initiative and makes things happen. Matthew 13, 3, Jesus says this. He told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. Now the parable, a parable is a story that you toss to somebody and you say, hey, what do you think? You know, and you give them this story and you have to work with a parable as opposed to just explaining everything in a PowerPoint, you know, bullet statements about theological truths. Jesus gives them this story. And so you kind of have to work with it to understand it. You have to put two and two together. Later, Jesus explains to the inner circle the meaning of it. And he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. God is broadcasting his seed. And we hear that the seed is the word. What's the word? I'm glad you asked that because uh, it just happens in the first chapter of the Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. So you can see the totality of the kingdom of God is the Word. And it echoes the first pages of the, of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to say, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So just between these two things, you can see the fullness of God as Spirit, Redeemer, Father. You can see that trinity of being all coming together. The sower is broadcasting the seed of the word. Now notice how he goes about it. It says the sower scattered the seed. 
he didn't just pick the choice ground. He's scattering it over all of the ground. He's not limited to, just to the good soil. Jesus said that he came not for the well, but for the sick. So God scatters his seed extravagantly. He doesn't just pick out a certain group who look like they have the potential to believe in him. I had the seed of the word sown to me many, many times. Uh, when I was a, a, a young kid, uh, when I was a, a teenager, when I was in college especially, I had good friends who told me about Christ and I listened to them and I thought that they were really nice people and I felt really you know, get glad that they were finding some meaning in this, but it just bounced right off of me. I went to campus crusade meetings that I had been uh, invited to and I listened to stories of people who had come to know Christ in a way that was alive to them. And to me, it was just like going to like an Amway presentation or something. It was just like, well, yeah, that's nice. You know, maybe I'll email you about it later, but it just bounced right off of me. And it wasn't until I had lunch with a, uh, a, a young girl that I had never met before, among other friends, and I didn't even know her name, don't know it now, and she was listening to, we were just talking about life and where we were and everything, and she listened to my story, and she said, Robin, I think Jesus has got his hand on your life. And it was like light exploded in the center of my being, and I knew he was real. And I knew I had to have them. How do you explain that? It wasn't the four spiritual laws. It wasn't the theological presentation of the gospel. It was just that seed that did it. God scatters the seeds over all kinds of ground, all kinds of time, and it's always happening. Without God scattering the seed, nothing happens. We are wood at the same time the sowers of the seed and the recipients of the seed. I think one of the crises that we're facing in America and Western Christianity is a loss of confidence in the gospel. Uh, we're so under siege, uh, mostly because of Christian culture, which is not the same as Christianity, uh, that we just want to keep our heads down and uh, not get into a big fight at Starbucks with a colleague or whoever you know, might bring this up. But the loss of confidence in the gospel, I think, is a loss of recognition of the power of this seed. And so one of the things that Jesus talks about in this parable is the transformational power when he talks about the good soil. We'll get to that in a minute. St. Paul, writing to the Christians in Ephesus, says this about receiving the seed. He said, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So I cannot say I gave my life to Christ at the point that that young woman told me because it was God's grace. It's a mystery. I can't explain it. All I know is that it happened. I know that God found a lost person. So God's broadcasting the seed of his son Jesus in the hope that it's going to penetrate the soil that it lands on. Have you ever heard the term original sin? Uh, that was a, a big one for me uh, in my religious upbringing in the previous century when I was born. <laughs> and I remember even then uh, my own friends, my you know, kids my age would say, I just don't get this. I mean, how can, you're saying a little baby is, is, is sinning? How can a little baby be a sinner? Well, I think one of the things that that reveals is we often equate sin with an act. You know, uh, so long before sin is an action, it's an inner disposition of the heart toward the self. I have a two-year-old grandson who demonstrates this regularly. <laughs> and uh, I took him to a place uh, where they jump around in moon bounce things and stuff like that. So I took him to the kitty one. And he was playing with some big rubber ball, and then he went someplace else, and another little two-year-old came in, and he immediately said, hey, that's mine, mine, me, me, mine, mine, you know? And I was like, yeah, okay, I get it, you know? So we're born with that 
kind of heart condition. Last Sunday, Father Peter baptized baby Elena. Her parents planted a seed in her heart. Father Peter marked her with holy oil, sign of the cross on her forehead as Christ's own forever. This is claiming her for the kingdom before she can even talk. And it's the same thing that Paul is talking about in that quote from Ephesians. None of us can say we did anything, had anything to do with our salvation. So as we, whether we're baptizing an infant or uh, coming to know Christ as an adult, it's God's action all the time. But it's also, uh, it's coming against this sin condition that we're born with. It's like being born into this world with an incurable virus. And all we can do is manage it, but we can't cure it. Jesus cured it on the cross. So what is the gospel? I'm glad that you asked. I've been thinking about this, so... It's not a slogan, it's not a sell job, right? It's not a set of religious propositions among other religious propositions. It's a proclamation. It's a cosmic proclamation of something that has happened. It's already done. It's saying that God has come into this world, into the evil that we struggle with, into the decay that we see around us, and he started the clock working backwards on death toward the day when he's going to restore everything. That's the gospel. The seed has the power to connect us with this God who's doing this. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus means that God did something about the life you live. When we see people in torment, uh, when we see all kinds of evil things happening, and we say, how much worse could this get? We can say God has come into this world and he's done something about it in Jesus. Christianity is unique in that it addresses our biggest problems. Things like suffering, guilt, evil, the future, death, what's going to happen. The gospel addresses those things. Jesus comes to earth without shortcuts. He doesn't come as a 30-year-old man. He comes as a baby. He starts life off in the smallest possible way, a, a cell in the womb of his mother. And he lives the whole life that you and I live, everything. But he lives a life that is so perfect. It is, is so uh, righteous before God that on the cross, he gives you all the credit for it. So Jesus' death on the cross pays for your sin and gives you all the credit for his perfect life before God the Father. That's big news. Because you know what it does? It frees you from the constant struggle to try to be a good person. A lot of people think coming to church, being a Christian, having your daily devotional time is so you can become a better person. It's not. You're already a perfect person in God's sight if you're trusting in Jesus for your salvation. The gospel does things once it's received. One thing it does is it relieves you of guilt. All the things that we've done, the things that we hope no one ever finds out about us, all fell on Jesus. He got all the blame for those things. And you got to walk away. He got he got condemned on the cross. You got acquitted. He dies. You get to live. That's the gospel. And it changes you. When you receive that truth into your heart, when that seed starts to penetrate, it changes who you are. And you start to live a grateful life, but not a self-righteous life because you know you can't be righteous in and of yourself. All you can do is bear the fruit that's been planted in you. That's the rescue mission of the cross. The gospel seed also gives you a place at the table. A lot of people go through life with a feeling that they've never found a place. And yet God gives that to you. Trusting in him means you get adopted as a son or daughter. The first chapter of the gospel of John says this, to all those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
children born not of natural descent nor human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Imagine that. God in Christ loves you as if you were his own daughter, just as if you were his very own son. That's real if you're trusting, if you're believing. And to trust and believe means to put the weight of your entire life on it. I mean, I have a, uh, an attic above my garage, and in order to get to it, I need to use an extension ladder to climb up and to get into the attic. I learned this from a friend of mine who was a roofer. He said, when you go up a ladder, before you trust that ladder, you go halfway up and you bounce on it. Boing, 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 boing. And if it holds, then it's set in the right place, right? <laughs> So I always, I've never forgot that. I get on the ladder and I bounce on it. And I think, okay, if it is going to give way, I've only got six feet to fall instead of 16. You know, that's what it means to believe in Jesus. That's what it means to trust in Jesus, is to put all of your life on that. So it's not just here. It's making the trip 18 inches from here to your heart. So when we believe God adopts us and if that isn't enough the gospel seed gives us a hope for the future an ultimate hope in the resurrection of jesus why do you think jesus rose from the dead and then showed himself to so many people you may not remember this but after the disciples jesus revealed himself to over 500 people over 40 days people saw him all over the place i mean really saw him it wasn't just a hologram. They would walk up and they could touch him, just like with his disciples. And St. Paul writes and says, just to underscore the veracity of the gospel, some of these people are still alive. He's writing a letter. He said, you can go talk to them. Now, some people say Christianity is a hoax because there were these really grieving, in shock, 12 disciples and these other women, and they were all hallucinating. Yeah. You know, the fact that this, you know, two-ton stone had been thrown away like a Frisbee out on the lawn and the, you know, well, yeah, no, they were just hallucinating. And Paul saying, well, how about 500 people? How about 40 days worth of this? So we can have confidence in the resurrection and confidence that it's going to be our resurrection. Jesus said to Martha as she was grieving the death of her brother Lazarus in John 11, Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Now, we read this in church, and then we go out to a funeral of a friend, and we say, I don't get it. I see people dying all the time. People who are Christians, people who believe in Christ. Why? What, I, what is this? Well, the first thing to realize is that when we trust in Christ, he brings the life of God into us. It's not like biological life. It's life the way God lives it. And it's called eternal life, which doesn't mean life after death. It means life that starts here and it just keeps going forever. It just punches right through the wall of death into eternity and it keeps going and it keeps getting better and better and better. What Jesus is saying here to Martha, what he's saying through his resurrection is that at the moment of our death, Jesus will take us away from death. That there will never be a split second, a nanosecond, when you are separated from the love of God. Jesus will take you by the hand and pull you through that experience, and you will never fall into the blackness of the abyss. That's why he says, you're never going to die. Because we'll always be connected with him, because he's going to do that. And he demonstrated it through the resurrection. And the end result of that is a resurrection in bodily form. Sometimes people forget that and they think, well, the resurrection means I'm going to be uh, rebirthed somehow, but probably on a spiritual plane that is higher than physical existence. And I'll be kind of floating in light and you know, there'll be other people floating out there too. And, you know, not so. God created physical existence because he loves it. 
He created a physical world. He created you because he wanted you to be. And you will be again. You will be raised and you'll be you. You'll look like you. We'll recognize each other. We'll have solid bodies. They just won't hurt anymore. We won't cry anymore. There won't be any more disease. They'll just be eternity. It'll just be glorious. And if that isn't enough, he's going to do the same thing with the earth. A new earth. We're not going anywhere. We're not going up into heaven playing harps. We're going to be here because he's going to make this new. The environment, the air, everything will be perfected. Everything will go back to the way he created it, which was good. Very good. Isn't that great? That's the gospel hope. All of those things are the gospel hope. And last of all, the seed of the gospel means in the end, there'll be justice. I think one of the hardest things about living is to see injustice, to see it against ourselves, our loved ones, to see it against other people. It's, in, in, it's rampant all over the place. We see injustice. We see people getting away with murder. We see all kinds of atrocities throughout history, throughout our own time. The good news of the gospel is Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, nobody's going to get away with anything, including me. It just means that all of my sins, all of my wickedness will be judged, but he will have taken the sentence for it, and I get to go free. You see? So yeah, we all face judgment, but we're already acquitted in Christ. And people who are evil, people who have sold themselves to do evil, they'll be brought to justice. We need to know that. Because more often than not, this is not a just world. It's an unjust world. But we know that the gospel promises in the end there will be justice. That's what the gospel seed does. As for what was sown on the good soil... This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. In closing, I want to say the sower has not stopped sowing. It brings us to this present moment, though. In the book of Hebrews 3.15, the writer says, Remember what it says. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did in the day of rebellion. Where's your heart this morning? Father in heaven, thank you for your generosity in scattering your precious son's life to this sinful and broken world and into our sinful, broken lives. Grant to us a gift of repentance that leads to life with you and life with each other and a true happiness and a looking forward to that great day where we'll be around that great gospel seed table feasting together in your presence forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.